Welcome in. You are speaking with the Meeples champion, and today begins our countdown. We are beginning another countdown. This one's going to be a little bit faster than 365 days. It's only going to be eight days. I just went through, and using Pub Meeple, I did an initial ranking. I put in all 365 games that we reviewed, and then I figured out the order of which it ranked them. Now, I did make a couple minor changes, nothing major, only about three or four games moved, and they didn't move more than a few spots, but there were some spots that I looked at and went, that doesn't look quite right. In general, though, Pub Meeple was like 99% correct. So I've ranked these, and starting with game 365, we're going to be going backwards, and I'm going to be giving you my least favorite to my favorite game out of all of these games I reviewed. You have the reviews to give you an idea as to the basic thumbs, you know, if a game has good art, if the game has good components, if if the game's unique. These are great factors for picking out, making sure that essentially the game works the way it's been created and that it stands out in its own way. But now is the question of the game itself. Is the game worth it? And for me, these rankings are going to help give you an idea as to what I favor. And that might help so that you can realize, hey, he gave this game seven thumbs ups. He it hit on every single thing, but he doesn't actually like the game. Whereas a game that might have only gotten one or two thumbs up, all of a sudden might be one that I loved. It's interesting how sometimes art doesn't matter. Components may not be the best and it doesn't matter because the game's just so strong behind it. So today, we're gonna be heading through our first 50. I have a list here that I put out. We're just gonna be seeing what we had and I'm gonna give you as good of an opinion as I can. I wanna to try to keep this video to about an hour. So hopefully we don't take too long on this. Now, starting at 365 is a game called Wordsmith. This one was 364, I actually shifted it down. Uh, the game that was 365, I was like, no, nah, that should be a few spots higher. Uh, Wordsmith just isn't a game to me. I, I a friend of mine gave it to me they always pick up games when they're in uh you know a a savers or a goodwill and he found this one and he gifted it to me and i just the game just didn't make sense it doesn't even make sense as a teaching game i feel like it could confuse kids more so so i didn't like that at all 364 not much better mr game uh mr game was one i picked up at a pax east i think it was my first or second pax east that i picked this game up Honestly, I picked it up all excited, and then I never even opened the game. I went and watched gameplays of it, and was like, man, this doesn't look fun. I don't know why I went and bought it. I was too excited, and I just really regretted getting it. It was a game that that the idea is about not having rules. Well, I'm a rules guy. If you don't give me rules, it really starts to make me not enjoy your game. I need parameters. It's okay to have ways to break those parameters, but it's not okay if the game just doesn't even have them. 363, First and Roll. This is another game the same friend gave to me as one of his, he, he actually already owned the game. He wanted me to test it out. It was like a magnetic football game. It just didn't make sense. Uh, I didn't really like anything. The Magnets was a cool concept and I'm always up for trying new ideas in a game, but I'm a huge football fan. I love fantasy football. This, the theme did not bring me in. They didn't do a good job making this theme actually feel like it was working as a game if anything it felt like it was a bad version of football and a bad version of board games if they had really pushed in one direction and made the theme feel really strong and the game still was bad it would have been a better game if they made it so the game was great but the theme was very minor that would have been better but doing half and half just made this the worst so 363 362 innovation i do not like this game. Now, I understand that Innovation, for a lot of you, is a pretty popular game. I've seen that this is in a lot of stores. I've seen this has a lot of successful expansions. I have a friend who loves this game. It, to me, feels like a game like Munchkin or Flux, in the idea that as you're playing, you have a goal, and as you're getting closer to the goal, people can start to target you or the goal to change how to achieve it. In Munchkin, you're trying to get to 10 stars, people can attack that and make it so that you start to reduce. In Flux, you have certain winning conditions, they can change the winning conditions, and all of a sudden it looks like you're about to get it with the next card, and everything changes, and now you're not even close. Innovation does this. The thing I don't like about it that makes it even worse than these two is, 
These two have pictures, have a theme. There is a theme kind of here, but there is no pictures. Every card is just packed full of words. It's, to me, it's just so boring. And I don't like games that shift up winning conditions constantly. So it was just the worst of both of those. That was my 362. Now, if you thought 362 was bad, this was ranked 365. This is the one I pulled up a few spots. My 361 is Pandemic. I just don't like it. This is not like Innovation. Innovation, I understand, is popular, and I understand people will like it. Pandemic, I acknowledge, is a good game. I do not like it. It was too strong into a theme I didn't like, into a play style I didn't like. I don't want co-op. I don't want to be playing in these these setups of it just it wasn't for me i know admittedly i've only played the game one time and i paid played this game like the year it came out so it just didn't hit for me and i've never gone back to try it again and maybe i need to give this game a second try i've really just gone and the culture of board gaming at that time compared to today for me is very different so maybe that's a game that if i went back to it i'd go like you know what i still don't love it but maybe this gets way further up on the list maybe this pulls into the 200s but for right now i have to look at how i feel and i felt like this is a game that i just don't want to play again so 361 pandemic 360 i know a friend of mine who i made joke upon joke that this would be the worst game for me he was probably very excited that it didn't make my bottom five but three years war <sighs> three years of war to be fair uh this was just i played this game twice the first game i didn't quite get it we all played it a little wrong but it was interesting the second game i figured it out and i played the game exactly as it should have been played and it was fun i liked using all the different types of markers getting my different types of resource payments how you got points and all of a sudden i get to the end of the game and everybody thinks I played a perfect game, and I got massively destroyed. And what I found was that there just wasn't a very strong, at least from what I could see, th there wasn't a strong, clear, this is how to win the game. The game felt imbalanced. I need balance to my game. I don't want it to be a clear-cut shot, okay, you do this, you win. That's too easy. But what I can't work with is when the paths to victory keep getting crisscrossed to a point where there is no path to victory where instead of you saying oh well there's probably 10 paths to take and if you took you know path one two or three you know it's most likely but in the case that multiple people are up there you could take path six or seven and in the case that you know that's one thing but this felt more like all 10 paths can win there's no clear-cut favorite and it's so close that when you're near the end of the game and everything made sense you're gonna realize everything just flipped i didn't like that it just it's one i i think i do need to play it again and see maybe if i get a different feel the next time but for right now 360 three years of war right above that 359 just desserts sushi go would be i guess the game that i kind of thought of with this the idea of the constantly changing types of food that you're gonna get you group them together you get things but this isn't that this is all face up there's no drafting it's it's paying for and then completing dishes the game is there you can see how to win but there's no fun to it i feel like it's just it's too face up it's too clear cut and it's to that point where it's like okay i see what you can do you see what i can do we know what's the way to win who's going to get there first and that's to me just it's it was missing an element there needed to be something added to this game to make it a little bit better and i don't think it's anything to change the cards i feel like there's a missing some type of a stage to the game maybe some way of getting a draft moved in here or some way of of disguising points but it just it felt like an incomplete game even though the actual play of the game is very clear cut you see how to play it's two face up and this game doesn't work that way so 359 just desserts 358 man versus apocalypse this is not a great game however it's a game that has its rules and it's not straight up there is there is a legit kind of back and forth here it's a little bit of surprise so now as of right now we've yet to hit a game i want to play again 
These are games that I didn't like. I might give a game here another shot, but giving it a shot is not the same as wanting to play. And I still have yet to hit a game I want to play again. This was an early little deck of cards I got from Kickstarter. It just never really hit for me. Uh, early Kickstarters, I don't know, three or four of the early ones I invested in just never really worked. And this was one of them. 357, Through the Ages, A Story of Civilization. Way too much going on. This was a game that you set it up and it just felt like we playing three games here there was just so many cards so many things to mark on your boards so much to keep track of when i played this game my friend and i got to the end we finished the game we did the winning condition to end game and had no idea which one of us was was winning the game so then we had to go through and count our points which took like a while and by the time we were finished we were like i guess you win didn't matter i lost i believe he won I, I think that's how it worked but to be honest i don't remember the game wasn't memorable we just both agreed like this was a waste of money like we never felt like we were really into it there are better versions of this game today because people have learned this game was just so many rules so much stuff to track and a lot of the elements that are great about this game could be broken down into smaller games that aren't just a card game you know, you could take this and break it down and get games that are still a complete, good-sized board game, but it has more theme to it, and it has less things you have to track, so you can have still a good time. It's not like you're playing an easy game. You're still playing a complicated game. But this was, like, beyond a 5 out of 5 of difficulty. This was hard to track. So that was my 357 Through the Ages, A Story of Civilization. 356, Chess 4. I mean, it's, it is what it is. It's a four-player chess game. That's all it is. I know chess. I love chess. I picked this game up to see how it would work. Hard to get to the table. Not a lot of people like chess. Never mind playing four players at chess. The Warlord chess game really opened up the door to, I can still play four-way chess here, but I can also play four-way corner chess. I can play a different version of chess. I can still use the board and flip it and use it as a two-player chess. There were options there. This one was just one option, and it wasn't a game I honestly am never going to play. 355. G.I. Joe, the deck building game. I really want to like this game. I want to. I've tried setting it up. I've tried playing it. What I need to commit to is a Saturday where I can get up and say nobody's home. It's just me. And I'm going to pull out a really good how to play video, set it up and watch that and set the game up as I'm doing it and really try to take mental note to figure out okay what is it i need to do because the rule book is so bad with this game that i'm never 100 percent sure what i'm supposed to do next they're not clear cut on design of which card is which some cards have different names at different portions of the book and all of a sudden they start to use a, a name for a card and you're like that's not in any of the cards in the basic rule setup over here when i go to look at the here's your components no component has that name and so you have a, a, an estimation of what a card should be, but you don't know for sure. Now, I'm sure a how to play video can help me with that, and that's fine, but I've tried to play this game using the rule book they gave, and it's impossible. They, it, it has to be a guess in order to do so, and I don't like that. That being said, the theme's great, and they have really good setup. I know the game will be fun if I know what I'm doing. 354, Burn in Hell. Burn in Hell is not a good game. It is, it's got a theme and it's got a clear cut like this is what you're supposed to do. It's all these horrible people that got put under the cards. It's, again, we've yet to hit a game I want to play again. There's a few that I'm willing to try again, but you know, G.I. Joe is probably the highest one as far as I want to try to learn that again. But as of right now, none of these games, if you were to ask me, do I legitimately want to play again because I've had such bad experiences. Burn in Hell is right there. It's not a good game. It's not one I want to play again, and I never will pull that game out again. I only learned the game because a friend of mine said, this is going to be the worst game you've ever played. I think it was because it was the same friend who had given me Innovation and Three Years of War, and I think he was hoping this would drop below those. Unfortunately, there was still enough game here that the game was better than those. It just was a bad theme, bad art, bad play setup, but the game was okay it just wasn't great 
So that was my 354, Burn in Hell. 353, Custom Party Detective. Nothing wrong with this game. It's not for me. It's a game that is really intended more for kids. A friend gave it to me. It's in my collection because I actually think one day when my daughter's starting to get towards games, it doesn't look like a bad game. I just didn't like it. But I'll teach it to my kiddo because I want her to learn games and it'll be a good transition game. But it'll be good for her. It's not one that I'm excited to play. I've played it once or twice. It just didn't hit for me. But you got to know what types of games to hold on to because they are a good transition game and this will be fine for that. I just don't want to play it myself. I would never pick it for me and my friends. 352. Ginger Dead House. Now, I no longer own this game. This is a game that I actually took to a bazaar and sold. It was a Kickstarter. I was really excited because it was going to fulfill, for me, two things I was looking for. One was, I was looking for Halloween-themed games. I wanted games so that when we got to the month of October, I could say, hey, let's play a Halloween game. Let's feel the theme. You know, if people want to do a party, I'm, technically speaking, an introvert, by definition. Meaning, I have no problem talking. I have no problem seeing people having a good time. But I prefer smaller groups. I prefer to, you know, stay in and play a, a video game or a board game or watch a movie than to go out to a party or to, you know, a big parade or anything like that. I just don't like big groups. But, I'm fine with doing a Halloween party. I just like the option of, instead of us having... 50 people over with loud music and lots of alcohol to instead have like 10 people over 15 and say hey why don't we put a game in the corner and like four or five of us can play the game we'll have some food out we can have some music over there you know give me the option to have a little bit of a relaxed spot and i used to do that with my old board game group all the time we'd have you know sometimes up to 20 people but we'd have a corner where it was hey this is the around the corner spot it's a little quieter this is the board game corner so i wanted to have some halloween games for halloween parties now this fulfilled that, and the art and the theme was great. The other thing I was looking for was I was hoping to find a tower defense game that I would like. I have yet to play a tower defense game I legitimately enjoy. It's just not my style game. This one was, instead of you tower defending as a group, which I'm not a co-op fan, you actually were tower defending against each other. Meaning, you would get a board, your opponent would get a board, you'd face each other, and you'd be able to start sending like monsters that were attacking you. You could use cards to like redirect them and send them to your opponent. Or to steal a defensive card from them and put it on your board. And you were trying to be the last one left defending. It, it was a great concept. It just didn't land for me. Uh, I'm not sure why this game just wasn't there. But it just wasn't. So that was my 352 Ginger Dead House. 351 Bananagrams. Uh, this is... I like word games. I like word games a lot. And when I think of these, I think of like hardcover, I think of Scrabble. Bananagrams is a game that I do not want to play because there's no board, so it's not contained. And it's just a little bit too open for me. That being said, it's not a bad game. So this is not one I would choose to play because of all the word games I can play, there are other ones I'll jump to. But it's one that I do think a lot of people do enjoy. And the good thing about this game is that it does allow you to just have a little pack of things in your pocket. You can pull them out, put it on a, on a table, and just play it anywhere. So it's a travel game. I'm not looking to use this one. If I'm going to be on a travel type situation, I'll pick something better. But I appreciate what the game is. It's a fully working game. There's no issue with the game. I just have other versions I prefer over it. So I don't hate this game. I just wouldn't want to play it. 350 Badass Riders. Now, this one is a motorcycle type racing game. And the idea is that you actually use all these cards to set up a race course and you race through it. Now, I got this when I was at a boys and girls club and somebody had dropped off like 20 games they didn't want. And my friend said, anybody want any of these games for free? And I looked through and saw this and was like, I don't know what this is. I wouldn't buy this ever, but I'll try it. So I grabbed the game and I test tried it and it wasn't for me. But I was happy I tried it. And it's definitely, if you're a racing fan, I think it's a great game and you'll enjoy it. I'm not a huge racing fan. I don't often pick racing games, whether this be, I don't like to play racing games on the on board games. I don't like to do it video games, unless you're talking like Mario Kart. I'm not a big fan of watching NASCAR or anything like that. I don't like to go and race cars. 
It's just not my thing. But this was an okay game. It was one that, despite it not being a popular title, was actually an okay game to play. So I wouldn't say don't get it. I just don't like it. It's not one I'll ever choose to play again. 349, and it's shocking I say 349 because this game used to be definitely in my top 20. Axis and Allies. Now, Axis and Allies is a game that I have played either three or four times. And if you've ever played Axis and Allies, you know that when I say that, I don't mean we sat down and we played for a couple hours. I mean, I sat down for a like 14 hour day on three or four different occasions and fully played through the game. It had a winner, or you know, winners and losers at the end. I used to love it because when I first was getting into it, I was still early in board games. Axis and Allies, I only started to play a little bit after I had learned how to play Catan and Ticket to Ride and, and Bang. So I was just kind of diving into this bigger realm of board games and going through the transition from the old school Clues and Monopolies. And this was one of those that was from the old school but was an old school version I had never touched. It was like one of the more complicated systems of an old school. And I was extremely excited to get this to the table. And we played it five player every time. And I had a lot of fun back in the day. But as my board games opened up and the world of board games expanded more and more and more, I looked at this game and I realized this is a game that's exhausting. It relies way too much on dice rolling. And it's just not one I ever want to have a full day of. I replaced playing this game as my big 14 hour day with a six to eight hour day of Twilight Imperium. And I found that that game is far more my style if I'm gonna to commit to a long day of a game. So while I used to love this game, it's one that I've officially put on the I never wanna play you again list. It was one of my faves back in the day, but it's just, it, it ran its course, I'm done with the game. So that was 349, Axis and Allies. 348, now this was another PAX East game, Cast and Capture. This is a deck of cards that you were flipping over and you were trying to collect and get trios. And you'd be trying to get like uh, a card and connect it to another card of the same color or flip a card in between that was a combo color and be able to connect them. It's just a pattern game. Um, I don't hate the game. I don't think it's necessarily very good, but I don't think it's bad either. It's just kind of a mediocre game that never took off. It's in my collection. I have no problem with it. It's just a deck of cards. And it's one of those games that I'm sure my, my daughter and I will at some point when she's a little bit older and I want her to see if she can start getting some pattern games down, I could probably pull this out and play with her. And I'd have no issue with that. I'm not against playing this game again. It's just not one that I'm excited to play. You know, but nothing wrong with it. I'd say this is an okay game. It's just not one that I'll ever personally choose to put to the table again. That was 348, Cast and Capture. 347, Robin Hood and the Merry Men. Oi, talk about a letdown of a Kickstarter. This game has the look, has the feel, has the components, has the storyline, the theme. But it feels so difficult to set up and to completely understand what you're doing. It's a combination of a co-op and a versus game you're co-oping because you can't be captured if the sheriff gets to one of you he's gotten to all of you so you cannot like completely ignore the fact that the sheriff is checking things trying to get to the cargo you have to commit money and effort to prevent this and anybody can do it and as a team you have to make a decision because if you're trying to win the game and you ignore him and as a result other people are doing really bad and now it's like well you need to be the one to do it we can't stop him and you don't everybody loses so co-op loss but if you don't lose to the sheriff and you get to the end and win the game whoever of you got the most loot wins the game so it's a balancing act it's a great concept i just it wasn't like gi joe i don't think the rule book is bad i just think it's a complicated game it's one of the highest difficulty levels I've ever picked up to the point where I had an extreme issue understanding this rule book. I set this up and played it by myself through multiple times. And every time I'd just be like, by the time I'm, I'm kind of getting it and I feel like I, I could play the game with everybody, I'm like, man, it's been like two hours and I'm just starting to get a concept and I got to teach everybody else this game. It just didn't hit for me. It's one that is on my sell list, but it's also on my, if I ever have a chance to play it with people, 
Maybe I just need to commit and try it again and see if it could be a good game. 346, match plus. This is another PAX East game. This one is using chips and trying to go match patterns on your, on your cards. It's nothing bad. Again, this is another one of those, hey, I might pull it out to play with the kiddo one day. It's not a bad game. There's just, there's no theme and the game is weak. It's not bad. It's just a weak game. I feel like it's not complicated to play, so it's more likely to get to my table than, say, the Robin Hood game on a second try again. But it's one that's really, in my opinion, at its level of complexity, an intro game. And this is one that I do expect to play with my daughter when I'm getting her ready for that next stage shift in board games. 345, Forbidden Desert. I don't like Forbidden Desert. And it's for one very strong and obvious reason. Forbidden Desert requires co-opness in a game where it's made for somebody to take charge. That's the reason I don't like most co-ops. I don't like it when a player has to take charge of a game. I don't like the idea of we're a team and when it's my turn, you're telling me what to do, which basically means why am I here? You could have just played this game solo and you could have done that. You could have played the different characters and you could run the game all by yourself. There's no luck factor. There's no rolling or anything. It's all my decision on where to go. So if you're going to tell me where to go, you're taking the turn. This game just leans way too heavy into allowing somebody who is a controller to play the game for you. And for that reason, I've just never enjoyed the game. 344, Shipwrights of the North Sea. I love all the games from the North Sea games, from the West Kingdom games. But the Shipwrights game, it didn't work well for me. It just, it felt like they were trying to fit a theme into their game and they didn't know how to make a game for that theme. You know, you get to the next game, you got Raiders, which I love. And I, I actually like that more than any other game from that company. But Shipwrights was just so forced. And it just was so boring to play. And at no point did I feel like it was a real battle. It's, it's a game that I will play again because I have got the whole trilogy. And I have their setup to be able to play the, the Tome Saga. So I'm going to play the game again. And I'm hoping if I can play this with maybe different people, maybe I can find some, maybe they'll point something out to me that'll help me see something I missed as far as like, oh, there's some strategy over here you're not seeing. But for right now, the game has got an amazing theme, amazing components, love the trilogy, love the company, but this is the game that just doesn't hit for me. 343 Zombie Kittens. Now, this is a game I picked up for the Halloween theme. It is essentially, it's kind of both an expansion and a standalone. You know, this was supposed to go with uh, with the, the another, and, and I'm forgetting what that game's called, but it's the other kittens game that it's a bigger part of. Uh, but it's fine. It's not that it's a bad game. You know, you're playing cards out there. You're trying to make like pairs and, and, and cause effects. And I believe you're trying to get to the point of, of getting rid of your whole hand, which is fine. The only issue with this is it's a game that relies on its humor and a game that relies on humor can't be played too often because you get used to the cards. And for that reason, I'm just not a big fan of this game. It's a game that I can pull out once in a while. I can play it. I can laugh. And then I need to put away for like a year, two years, because if I play it in shorter time than that, I, I've already seen all this. I need to forget so I can find it funny again. There's a big group of these games, these games that are about humor when it comes to the words or the pictures, and that's what it relies on. And when you're doing that, this just doesn't work for me in the long term. 342, 8-Bit Attack. Now, this is one of the first games I played that was a co-op that I was actually pretty okay with. Uh, the idea of 8-Bit Attack is you're using the old 8-bit graphics for your cards, and you're all working as a team in what feels like one of those old school RPG video games. And you're going through, you're fighting your stages, you have to keep up your life, you have to get up your swords, your defense, you're fighting different monsters, you have to pick out how to spend when you, when you defeat a monster, what you spend for your different earned points to then upgrade on your guys. Hey, we need you to be our shield guy, we need you to be extra health, 
We need you to have better magic. It's an it's an interesting game. Uh, I liked it. I had a good time. I wouldn't choose to play this game again, but I wouldn't be upset by playing it either. 341, Quizquaz. Quizquaz is an interesting one because the concept of the game is, is that it is a quiz game tic-tac-toe with a die. Seems like a lot all thrown into one little setup here. So the idea is, is that you're going to get a board, somebody else is going to get a board, and you're going to roll a die, and that die is going to tell you what you're going to get for your question. But it also lines up where your question can go on your quiz board. You're going to get the question, you have to answer based on a number. If you get it right, you cover up that spot, the next person goes. First person for tic-tac-toe wins. The game actually works really well. The problem with the game is that you could be the better player and you could lose because you just keep on rolling the repetitive numbers you've already had before or you keep rolling out of order you know if you if you and your opponent go and you just keep getting in you know the, the four corners or you get you know some type of a setup where it's like oh we got like one two three one two three you can get six correct your opponent could get three correct and your opponent could win because it just so happened they got one two three in a row now i like it for the fact that this takes away from the classic setup of Oh, well, this player is the obvious better player at quiz games. They're going to win every time. Okay, well, the luck factor hurts that for them a little bit. But I wish there was a way to have a little bit more control. You need to find a balance between it being completely random and it being you can just choose. I like the tic-tac-toe aspect of it because it allows you to have something to goal orient towards. I just wish there was something extra to help the game a bit. I don't hate the game. It's so quick. It's one I don't mind playing. It's just... I found that the game went kind of fast and I, I played it a bunch and then I didn't want to play it again. Number 340, Star Wars X-Wing Miniatures Game. I played this one time. I only played the game because I went to board game night. It was, it was when we had my current group, but before COVID, when we used to go play at the Boys and Girls Club. And the idea was we all came in one night and they basically said, okay, these people are going over to that table and us four are going to play here and it's a two-player game so you and this other person are going to be facing each other and the two people who knew what they were doing are going to be the coaches and they were like we really want to teach you this game and we we're like okay we'll try and i love star wars and i love all of it but i'm a big fan of the original trilogy i love rogue one i loved andor uh, mandalorian i can enjoy the prequels once in a while i don't mind episode seven i could do without ever seeing eight or nine again um, but this game, it's just, you're using rulers to like figure out the aim, to then fire guns, to fly. Like it's some people really get into this. It's not for me. This is not what I want to do. I understand the concept of it, but if I'm going to do this, I'd rather go buy a video game and play the Star Wars video game that allows me to fly around and shoot. I don't need a board game to do this. This is just not my style. That being said, it is an extremely popular play style, popular game. It is not bad by any means. It's just not one I ever want to play again. 339, and don't ask me how I forget how this happened, that literally, the sh it is 345, 339. From Forbidden Desert to now 339 Forbidden Island. The only major difference as to why I like this a little bit more than Forbidden Desert, I think it's really just the look the desert i didn't like it, it felt visually a little bit more meh to me and the island was a little bit more uh popping for its colors so i if you're gonna have me play this game again i would pick forbidden island because i like the visual of that more than desert and that's why it's popped up this extra little level that little extra detail helped the game but essentially it's the same complaints as forbidden desert it's just, if you're asking me to play any of these games, from Forbidden Island down to Forbidden Desert, Desert drops the extra drops, because if I have to pick one, I'm picking Island, and then I'm not picking Desert, like, right after Island. The likelihood is it's dropping a bunch, because other games I'm going to pick before I pick another similar game. Forbidden Island just had a little bit more visual, but otherwise, it's the same complaint. People can take charge. Flashpoint Fire Rescue. I played this game once at an, a like a room full of board gamers. We had a little like families invited day of board games. 
and it's you playing firefighters trying to go in save cats and kids and parents and put out fire and try to prevent the spread it's fine and it works and there's nothing wrong with it i don't like co-ops so it's not a game i would want to play very often it's not one that i own it's not one i want to own it's not one i would want to choose to play but it works it was actually a perfectly fine example of a co-op game it's just not my style 337 the village crone now this was another one i picked up specifically for the halloween theme the village crone being that you're trying to be a witch for your village and you essentially have to complete three spells to win you're running around you're collecting different types of of ingredients you can only hold so many things you have to get to the right locations to then like drop them in it's fine but it just it, it was just my, like my little sister played with me and she actually really liked the game i just didn't get into it i felt like it was missing something and i've never been able to m really figure out what it was missing but there was just some element to the game i didn't like i love the concept that you were still moving around a board that you were collecting things that you were doing spells the spells i believe had a result on the game so i think you could do things to screw with the game but it just wasn't quite right for me uh it's one of those games that because of its theme and because my sister loved it if i she wanted to play it i would play it but it's on my i'd like to get rid of it list i've put it in my corner of games that i'm hoping to get rid of at some point uh you know i've only got so much space i do have a little bit more storage coming in but it was my last storage i'm hoping to ever buy and I'm looking to just kind of cull a bit, and that's part of the cull list. 336, Windmill, Cute Secrets. Now, this was a game I actually got this year at PAX East, and I got it for free. Uh, I was going through a line, it was on the last day, and the people who were there basically said, hey, so we are trying to reduce down to a certain level of games for our cart to, to go back so that we don't have to pay the extra additional like crate fill cost. Uh, this game is one that we're just decided to give all the small copies away of. So they were giving it away for anybody who bought anything at their location. They were giving that as a gift extra. It's fine. It's nothing wrong with the game at all. Uh, I pulled it out. I tried it. It's a cute little card game. You know, you're playing as these, these like an owl and different little animals and, and things. In the, like it's, it's perfectly fine. It's not a game that I would ever choose to pull it and play, but I have no issue playing it. It's just. You know it's a basic tiny little card game um i think my little da my little kiddo would really enjoy playing with those cards i despite the fact that i wouldn't want to play this game much i'm not one to just throw a bunch of my games at a kid to let her destroy them so i've not let her play with these yet but when she's a maybe five or six and she's a little bit more at an age that i trust her i'll let her play with these cards and maybe even try the game 335 and this is one a lot of you haven't played yet this is a game that I got to test try. It was sent to me by the creator at, right before its Kickstarter was going to be was going to be up and running. The game was called The Stifling Dark. Now, The Stifling Dark is a game I actually would like to try again. It's not one I'm excited to play. It's not my style. But the idea is that you're all going into a house and it's pitch black. So you're using flashlights to be able to see in the dark and you're trying to make your way through the house. You're trying to complete certain objectives and get out of there. Uh, it's definitely one that to me is a great theme for like a Halloween night, like playing, you know, playing in the dark, you know, de decrease the light of the room, trying to make it like really fit to the theme. Um, it seems like a, a, a cool idea. I got to play with a prototype and I'm excited. They are sending me a free version for having reviewed them. They actually, I didn't know this. Uh, I sent back to the next reviewer and then they messaged me and were asking me stuff. I was like, oh, you know, your game seemed really cool. It's not like my, my style game. And they're like, oh, well, we actually, for reviewing, we're just going to give you a copy for free. And I was like, oh, well, I'm not going to say no to free. So wasn't expecting to get any kind of payment. I was doing the review because right now my channel is just growing and I'm trying to do reviews and, and give people a chance to get stuff that's going to be a Kickstarter or coming to a store soon out there. And this was one that I was excited. It was a big game to get a prototype in the mail was pretty cool. So I, uh, I am excited to try it again. It's not my style game. I'm not sure it's one I'm going to really choose very often, but it's cool to have it in the collection. So I'm excited. 334. I already talked about how I'm not a big fan of tower defense games, but I couldn't deny that this is a fun game. Even though it's not one I want to play again, it was way better. Castle Panic. 
Castle Panic is a game that really has the setup of you're working as a co-op. People, you have all these monsters coming in from multiple directions. It's not one I would choose to play again, but I also don't hate the game. It works as a game really well. You just, you're in the 300s right now. The odds are you're not going to have a lot of games that really just work. But this game, this is one that I have no problem with. I would not be opposed to playing it again. I don't dislike the game. I just don't like the game. 333, Unspeakable Words. So this is a Cthulhu-themed game where you're trying to go out and make different words. However, in order to do so, you have to score points, but you have to be aware of how much you're using for your point values of your cards, because when you do this, you then roll a die. And if you roll a die and it ends up being a higher number than whatever it is that you pointed out for your word, then you're going to take a madness. So you're trying to get to 100 points, but you're also not trying to get to 5 madness or else you go insane and you lose the game. So you have an interesting balance here. I like it because the odds are, you know, you could keep going for low words, but I'll get 5, 5, 5, and you're probably not going to go insane. But you roll a one or a two and it's like, oh no, I could have gone it all out and done a 20 point word and still taken that madness and be way closer. Or your opponent might be getting 15 point words and got lucky two or three times and all of a sudden they got one madness, you've got one madness, and they're 30, 40 points ahead of you and now they can slow down. So it's an interesting game. I don't dislike it. It's just not one that I, I choose to play ever, but it's still in my group of I wouldn't sell it. So that is Unspeakable Words. 332, Happy Salmon. This is a party game. Uh, this is not one that I would choose because I don't love party games, but I play at my family get-togethers all the time. Happy Salmon's all about you have to like pull out a card and you're yelling, I have this card, I have this card. Somebody else says, I have it too. You basically have to put the cards down and then you have to do it. So you might have to do like, okay, we're going to slap hands and do the salmon wave. Or you're going to do, you, know, you do different types of like handshakes. And then when you do it, you start yelling the next one. And the first person to get rid of all their cards wins the round. And it's very simple. It's fun. It is a perfectly fine family party game. It's just not one that I'm interested in owning or picking to play myself. My version of picking a game is to pick a game for my game night with my friends or to pick a game to play with my wife. Those are if, if the game gets there, I like the game. If the game is one that I'm okay to play because like my family chose to play it or somebody at game night chose it and I'm going to play with them, that's fine, but it's not something that's as high on the list. 331, Codenames Duet. So this is the two-player Codenames game. This is perfectly fine. This is just about communication and trying to see if you can do as well as you can before you lose to the board. I prefer the two-on-two -two version, classic Codenames, but Codenames Duet is still a good game for training. I think that that's where it comes in. Is it one I'm going to pick very often? No probably never going to pick this game i keep it in the collection because you know what if we have six people and people really want to play code names it's a popular game the other two people can play code names duet so it's kind of the fill-in for if i by accident have six people playing you two play this we'll play this winning team continues losing team becomes the duet team the duet team now had some training they come in they get to challenge the winner it's a great way to keep a, a rotation going so 331 code names duet 330 waking shards this was another one that was sent to me by the creator they wanted me to do a little review for them uh they actually gave me the deck it didn't come with any there was no box for it there was there was i'm not even sure if waking shards was the end result name i believe it was but i know that was still in question at the time but it's just a game where you're playing out cards against each other and it's a very fast five minute game it's one that while i may not want to ever pick it again because i didn't find the game amazing it's so fast that it's not a bad game to have and i like that i can just pull it out in a big group of small games or for a playing game and be able to pull it out and play it so this might be a playing opportunity game for me but in general it was okay the art was great the theme was great the concept was great it just wasn't a game that i loved but it wasn't a game i hated 329 rest in peace this was another game i got for halloween uh the idea of you having a box that opened up this essentially a, a a game about playing out your little pieces and your cards to try to 
essentially not die <laughs> it's it's an interesting concept of a game i loved the box it was small it opened up like it was a crypt um it's it's fine i don't think it's a game i would pick often but i will admit if it's halloween and i'm trying to get people to play games i would put this on the table i would actually put this up on the table and give it as an option to play somebody might say yeah i'll play this one and go off and play two player to the corner or they might play a bunch of us together because they really want to play whereas like say a game like ginger dead house i sold it because i didn't want to ever play that game again you know a game like the village crone is on my selling list this game i wouldn't sell it's not one i love but it's one i would pull out for halloween and put on the table as an option 328 agricola agricola is fine i've played it solo a couple times the problem with agricola is it is a little bit of a complicated game and like for instance at home i couldn't play with my wife so this is a game to play with my friends but with my friends none of us want to play it because we'd rather play caverna caverna was the same game just it was done well agricola is not bad it's not bad it's just there's a better game out there that does exactly what this does but better agricola is a game that i'd have no problem if somebody said i'd really like to play agricola i'd sit down i'd play with them i think that it's all really well built and everything it's just i tried it i enjoyed it i tried it solo a couple times i was excited to play then i played caverna with my friends before i got to play agricola and i was like this is way better and they were like yeah this is this is the clear-cut better version and agricola just fell to the side because of it there's too many games out today to play every game constantly and you're gonna find games that compare and that's where this one fell this game would have been much higher wherever caverna shows on the list agricola probably would have been that spot but because caverna got played and i thought that was the better game agricola fell the next one up parcheesi oh my goodness how is parcheesi at 327 how does parcheesi beat out this many games i'll tell you how it does it because parcheesi well being an old game with very limited option it does from the old school games have some pieces that gives you control and it's not pure luck you're rolling dice you have to roll fives to get a piece out of your spot and get it on the board you can either add the dice together and move one piece or you can move two different pieces you can have pieces land together to make a wall and block opponents from block from passing you you can roll doubles to go again okay you know that's whatever you get onto your color road to the exit it's tough because now you have to roll exact you can't roll more and get in you have to roll exact so the closer you get it harder it gets but at the same time when you're going up that road nobody can hurt you whereas if you're by yourself you're not in a duo and somebody lands on or goes past your spot you have to go all the way back to your base so this game is simple and it's still a dice rolling game but the dice have a lot of options. It's not a pure roll and move. It's a roll and options. That opens up the door to so much. Are you spending that five to move him out or move the guy on the board? Are you spending this combo to move one guy or move them both? Are you trying to get somebody out because you have the opportunity to get them off the board? You just rolled the exact number you need? Or instead, are you taking advantage to say, you know what, he's safe. Let me take this guy and just skyrocket him closer. Are you trying to target your opponents? Are you trying to protect yourself? Are you trying to block? There's a lot of options here, which is why this game, despite being on the older side, gets the move up. Do I own it? No. My parents do. Do I want to play it? No. I'm going to pick other games over this. But is it a game that I appreciate, and if people want to play it, I jump at it? Yes. If my little sister or, or, or any of my sisters were to say to me, hey, let's play Parcheesi today, I'd be like, let's play Parcheesi. I have no problem playing the game. I'd be excited to play the game. I just wouldn't pick to play it, because there's so many other games I want to play more than it. 326 Hafid's Grand Bazaar. Now, this is an interesting one. I bought this game not knowing what it was. Uh, I went to a local board game store. Uh, I was actually over in the Cambridge area of Massachusetts, and I was at Pandemonium. And I went downstairs and I said, I'm buying a game today. And I didn't know what I was going to get. And I walked around and just couldn't find a game that was one of the ones I really wanted. And then I saw this, and it wasn't too expensive, and I was like, let me pick it up. The concept of the game is that you're getting different cards, you're moving, you have to spend the 
points you have to go and to do different abilities. So you'll go and be like, I'm going to go to this spot. And it's going to allow me to now grab more cards or to spend cards. And you're doing different actions and you're trying to get sets. It's a fun game. I played it two player. It was good, but I would never play two player again. But I would love to play this at the higher play count. I think at six player, this game looks like it could be a blast. It's just one of those games that I think has to be played at a high play count. And it's not a game I would play with my friends. So for me, this is one of those games that if I could get all my family to play, it would be a family night game that I think could be a blast. But because of that, it falls into this realm of, well, I'm not going to often play the six player with my family. And I'm not often going to get my sisters and my wife and, and everybody to want to play a game like this. Even though it's not complicated, it's not easy compared to the games they prefer. They like party games. So it just kind of falls into a realm of, eh, someday. 325. Splendor. Ooh, Splendor. I remember the excitement I had when I got Splendor. I played it. I loved it. I bought it. I played it. I loved it. I bought it for my phone, and I played it by myself versus three AI characters. Hundreds of games. I like Splendor. What I've discovered about Splendor is that it's really difficult to not have first place and fourth place have a tight game it's not a runaway game the way it's designed is way too even i feel like it's not even possible to not have a good game in this unless you are trying to i have played so many games and i've never ever seen last place be more than like four or five points behind first place now maybe it's because most of my games is on a computer you know against the ai but, and, and maybe it's because I'm playing against my friends who, when you're playing this game in person, they all know what they're doing. But to me, I don't want to play a player who doesn't understand the game. I'll teach you, and that's fine. But I want to play against players who know what they're doing. I don't like, I would rather lose every time I play a game, but have a fun competition, than win every time and have the game be a blowout. It's not fun. The W isn't what I'm after, it's the experience. I, to earn a win against a really good group of players is amazing. But to get a win against bad players doesn't feel that good. And this game, in order to not be a close game, feels like you have to play against bad players. I just, it's not that I'm looking to blow anybody out, but it's more so the idea of it's really annoying to constantly play and be like, man, I feel like I was in this, but I was fourth place, but I was only three behind. It just feels like the game plays itself a little bit. Uh, it's still a good game, and it's still one that I'll play on my phone on occasion, and I'd have no problem playing with somebody. I just wouldn't pick the game myself anymore. Number 324, Lost in Straya. Now, this is another Kickstarter that it was fine. Uh, it's a card game. It's You're in this place called Straya. Essentially, it's like the Amazon, and you're trying to collect different items to help you as you're moving along and dealing with different situations and you're trying to survive Straya, essentially. Uh, it's it's almost like a little miniature adventure, uh, uh, an RPG in a way. It's fine. I have no problem with the game at all. It's one that I think that when my daughter's maybe eight or nine, this would be a great game to pull out for her to play together and to teach her the concept of like an RPG style game with cards. Uh, I had think the game works fine. Again, it, we've yet to hit a game that I'm going to pick myself. But it's a game that does get higher on this list because I see playability with it with my kiddo in a few years. 323, Takedo. I used to own Takedo. I sold it. I didn't hate the game. I sold it because I realized I didn't think I was ever going to get it back to the table. The reason is the game is good, but you're dealing with a game where I feel like I feel like this game could be better with maybe a different theme or or maybe not even a different theme but something to change up how all the pieces work. You know, you're you're essentially on a setup of you have one long line and you all start at the beginning and player 1 goes and they can pick anything they want from the first spot all the way to the last spot. But wherever they go, they stop, they collect that item, they're done. Now the next player goes. And if they want to go to the very first spot, they can. And now they're done. And then the next player, the next player, the next player. Once you've all taken your initial first turns, 
you now don't go back to the first player. You go to whoever is the furthest back on the board. So you go to the person who's on the furthest back spot and they go. Now, if there were people went and you had them on spots nine, eight, six, five, and one, the next player could say, well, I'm gonna go to spot two, spot three, spot four, and they could do each spot and then say, all right, now I'm jumping to spot seven. And now the player in spot five goes next. So you have that, which that works great. It's a concept of trying to make your decision on what to grab when, because when you take a spot, unless it's a spot that has it extended with multiple spots above you, a lot of the spots are you go there and nobody ever can go there again. Because in order for, you, for them to go there, you'd have to move and you're not going to move until everybody's ahead of you and you can't go backwards. So you have that set up for the game, meaning certain spots are going to be snagged and never grabbed by somebody else. But then you're also trying to balance. Are you building the picture? Are you investing money in the above to give to the charities? Are you grabbing more money? Are you trying to, to, to move and get certain resource types? It's fine, but it, it feels a little chaotic at times and a little boring. It's, it's a game that I wish had something extra to it. So I heard that the expansions do a lot for this game, but I've never tried those, so I can't speak to that. But the game in general, it just isn't quite what it was when I first got it. I first got it, I was excited, I played it with my family, they didn't like it. I played it with my friends, they didn't like it. I played it with my next group of friends. A couple of them liked it, a couple of them didn't. This is a game that doesn't hit for a lot of people. So I actually like the game, but the reason I sold it was I realized nobody else did. And one or two people isn't enough. You need to play this game at five. You can play it four, maybe maybe three works, but in general, I'm not gonna keep a game in my collection that I'm only playing once every few years. So that's why I had to move on from the game. I don't dislike the game, and if somebody picked to play it, I'd be excited to play it again, but I gave up trying to pick it because if you're playing with people who don't wanna play, it's not fun either. Number 322, Kingswood. Kingswood is a pretty cool game. Uh, the concept is you randomly put out your different things you can do in a circle, you're going to be going to different locations to activate how you're going to be activating your piece on, the, on your made together board. It's a cool setup. It's just one that I have yet to really get to fully play, but this is one I do want to play again. I am excited to pick it. I think that there's game here to be played, so I am going to be picking this again. I would say this is one of the first games that I genuinely feel like there is more game here. I just haven't played it enough. I tried it a couple times and it didn't land well, but I've watched playthroughs and I'm like, I think I just didn't understand the game well enough. So I think this would really rank higher on the list next year. I just don't know where it is yet because I've yet to get a true full playthrough of it. It needs more opportunity with people who know what they're doing with me so that we can really test out this game. Number 321, Sleep Tight. Uh, Sleep Tight was a fun card game about a battle back and forth you're basically dreaming you're trying to win the game as a, either as a team or you can try to you know switch it up and you could be trying to win individually you could be the bad guy the good guy you might be giving the other person nightmares you know you don't know what that person who you are and what your ability is so you, you it's a real battle there uh, i had a lot of fun i actually played that like seven times in a row with my friend it's not one i would ever choose to play but i'd have fun playing it again it's just not one of those games I want in my collection because it's not my style, but I liked it. Ooh, 320, Clans of Caledonia. Now, I know that reaction probably has you saying, how do you react that way after all the games you've been speaking about and it's not further down the list? Clans of Caledonia is exactly the style game I should love. And I want to try this again. I've played it probably three times. I want to try it again because I feel like I'm missing something and I think what I'm missing is I've yet to play this game close quarters multiple times. Every time I play it it's months later. I think I need to play this game and then play it again a week later and then play it again a week later and then I might get into it because it's everything I like. It's to me this looks like it should be better than Caverna and Agricola and I definitely enjoyed it more than Agricola because there's a lot more of the movement on the board. I like the board setup. Agricola didn't have that. So that I really enjoyed, but the buying, selling, and trying to go and complete jobs, it's all stuff I love, but this felt so mundane while I was doing it. I felt like I was just like so far behind. 
but I keep playing it with my two friends who this is a style game that they kill at. So every time we play, I get wrecked. And I told you, it's not about winning. But it is kind of demoralizing when you play a game and every time you're like, well, here's first place at 100, here's second place at 96, you're third place at 40, and you're like, what? How did I lose so bad? Now, that's an extreme. I don't remember if that's the scoring, but it was the rough estimate. I've never done well in this game. I'm last place every time. I get wrecked every time. I, I'm missing something when it comes to understanding the concept of how to play the game, and I need to learn better about how to do it. So it's one that's up this high because I know I like it more than Agricola. I'll play it before that. And I know I want to learn it better. I just have to get there. The next one up is Zombie Shuffle. <laughs> I don't know exactly how this got up this high. I think the reasoning is it's a deck of cards. It's very fast. It's a Halloween theme, meaning this will join rest in peace on my Halloween table. I'd have no problem tossing on the table for an option to pick. And it's a fast game. Uh, it was a Kickstarter. I backed this way back in the day, you know, 10, 12 years ago. Um, it's it's nothing great. It's nothing bad. I wouldn't pick to play it, but I also wouldn't have an issue with playing it again. I feel like there's probably a game here that I could pull out in like, hey, you haven't played it in six years, and you put it on the table and you play it for a whole afternoon. So it's it's got that ability for me, if I want to pull it out, that I'm going to get to play it for hours. It's just a game I'm not often going to say I want to pull it out. 318 police precinct uh so this is a concept of a game that i didn't think i'd like i'm not a big one on police games i just not that i dislike the police i just not into that theme and i'm not a big co-op fan but this game was fun i played it three or four times back in the day i had a friend who was a you know he was from a family of cops so he liked cop uh themed games and he liked co-ops and we had a lot of fun you're running around the city you're trying to find evidence so that you can take down the bad guys you are trying to catch people as they're you know doing certain things you'll have it where it's like oh well you've got to go and, and find the evidence but while you're doing it there's also things happening that you have to go prevent or else you're going to have some some bad stuff happen on the board and if that happens you essentially have two different charts you have one that's charting what your evidence found and when you get to a certain level you win the game but while you're trying to get that you also have a chart for bad things happening and if you're not doing your daily work because you're ignoring it that's increasing and if it ever fills up you have failed as a police station so you may on the same round find the murderer but you've also allowed so much petty crime through that you've let your city fall to shreds it's a cool balanced game i wouldn't ask to play this game but it's one of the better co-ops i've played 317 the game of life it's up here because it's an old school game that well i don't want to play it again it's okay you know and I, I think that i actually played this about a year and a half ago with my sisters they really wanted to play one day and i was like sure let's play and it's still fun you know you got the options of do you want kids do you not want kids you want to get married do you not want to get married are you going to get a job are you going to get an education you're making all these choices and you're moving through this game and i like that i think that it's a cool concept you're not rolling a die you're spinning your dial it's a fine concept of a game i wish that they'd update it I feel like it's been long enough they could go and make the effort to update this game and put out a better quality product but it's one that i'll play with the family once in a while they like to play an old school game and i'll i'll play this once 316 quicksand now quicksand is a game that i picked it up because it was supposed to be an easy version of playing name of the rose the idea of like a hidden hidden idea who you were and moving through you're going to have different characters. You're going to be trying to move throughout this quicksand jungle. And you're trying to get from like the beginning to the end. I think you have to pick out an item as you go. It's a very small board. It's a 15 minute game. It runs fast. Uh, it's fine. And it's all about, you know, moving the different colors. Just like you do in, in Name of the Rose. You don't know which color belongs to who. And hoping to get your character to be the one that gets the end first. It's a fun little game. I think this will be one that when my daughter is older, I want her to teach her this one. Because when she learns this, she'll have learned an aspect of Name of the Rose, which is one of my favorite games, and I want her to be able to play that game with me. So that was number 316, Quicksand. Well, that was the 50 games for today. I hope you guys enjoyed the list. As of yet, 365 games, the first 50 we've gone over, I don't want to play these games again. There's games on here that I will play again, because either somebody else likes them that I am friends with, or I would like to give them another chance to see if maybe I have a different opinion of it down the line. 
But in general, if you were to just say to me, would you like to play this game because you want to have fun today? None of these games make that list for me yet. That's what you'd expect with 365 reviews. If you love, out of 365 reviews, every game, that's too much. Now again, I don't hate these games. When you're talking about disliking a game, I would say right around 352 at Ginger Dead House is where from then on I dislike the games. But the games above that, I would say are games that I either didn't enjoy or that I just wouldn't want to play again. But that's the first 50 we've got. Tomorrow I'll be bringing you the 315 all the way through the 366 game. And we'll be doing another 50 or 266 game, not 366. And uh, we'll be doing another 50 games for you. We'll see where those land. We'll see what I feel about these. Fingers crossed we're going to have some games I actually really enjoy there. And I can tell you that I'm recommending. Well, you have been speaking with the Meeples champion. And don't worry, I'll be back tomorrow with those next 50. Until next time, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Thank you.